Well, hello everyone and welcome, welcome to Aging Well. We are so glad you're here. And for those of you who join us every month, you know that I always thank our team because it's, you see me, you don't see the rock stars behind the scenes. And typically I thank Tom Roth, Courtney Hayes and Audrey Belfaro. Well, this month, Tom had other professional commitments. So it, pre it prevented him from being here and being our technical whiz kit. So I just have to give huge shout out to Courtney, Courtney Hayes tonight, because she is doing the lion's share of the work. So Courtney, you know we love you and we could not do this without you. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Courtney is with our aging program. Audrey Belfaro is with our Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. And even though he's not here, we always have to give a shout out to Tom. He is with our CTSI. So anyway, thank you. And again, thank you to y'all, because if you weren't here, we wouldn't have anything to do on the second Tuesday of every month. So we're so glad you're here. You know, spring is around the corner. And for those of us who live in Winston-Salem, um, I was out in my t-shirt today and it just, oh my goodness, it just, I've got a horrible case of spring fever. And I mean, this may be a good time to, to let everybody know we have over 800 people who follow us all over the country and England, Ireland, Germany, Canada, and Costa Rica. So if you're from any of those venues joining us tonight, then welcome. And I hope the weather is as beautiful for you where you are as where it is right here. You know, it's, it's March and you know what that means. St. Patrick's Day just around the corner. And you notice, even though it's not officially St. Patrick's Day until Sunday, I just want to make sure that I'm not getting pinched unless I want to get pinched. So I'm wearing green from here on out. So without further ado, we went into the archives to pull a wonderful video that many of you have actually requested. Opie, Opie Kirby is the former owner and chef of Finnegan's Wake in downtown Winston-Salem. And so we wanted to show this again because this is an amazing Guinness Irish stew that he's making. So Opie, take it away. Hey everybody, my name is Opie and I work at Finnegan's Wake on Trade Street. We are the Irish pub in town. We say we're the number one, and that may be because we're the only one, but either way. I'm here with Deb this morning and part of the Aging Well series uh, that's going on that, that we're just trying to promote uh, healthy eating and good habits and at the end of the day, today, my business. Um, so one of the, what we're gonna make today is Guinness stew, which is a very traditional Irish um, dish. St. Patrick's Day is coming up. We are definitely gearing up for that. It's our busiest day of the year. Um, so here we are in the kitchen at Finnegan's Wake. Um, Guinness stew, as I said, is what we're going to make. It is beef, carrots, onions, gravy, some herbs, and mashed potatoes. So it's really easy. A lot of the things you will do today, you already do at home. Some of the things I won't even do because you already do them at home and know how to do them. So um, we already cut up the meat, unfortunately, to, to get it ready yesterday, but so I won't be doing that, but we've got some onions here. So I'll go ahead and cut those. And ultimately the vegetables, it's a wonderful thing because it doesn't matter how big or how small you want them. Um, it's kind of up to you as far as what size, you know, how, how big of a bite do you want is really what it comes down to uh, for us. What I do is just cut the onion, you know, in half, take both, both ends off, and then I just kind of cut it, kind of quarter it long way. So you get some of these big pieces, you get some of these little pieces, and that's it. And then we'll just break them up when they go in. <clears throat> Grab one carrot. And again, there's only about four things, five things in this whole recipe, and um, it's one of the easiest things you can do. You can make it ahead of time. You can make it a few days ahead of time. Um, it's good for a party because you can prep it in the afternoon if you want and just kind of leave it. 
Um, again, with the carrots, the same as the onions. It's all, it all depends on what size you want. Um, we usually cut them on the bias like that and make kind of these little discs, I guess you'd say. And there we go. So pretty much that is your vegetable prep. Um, it couldn't get much easier than that. Um, do a quick helpful hint as far as how to chop an onion if you want to dice it, slice it, whatever you want to do. So there's the stem or the core piece, let's call it. Just take the top off and then peel it. There's a kind of a watery layer right there, so I'll take that down to the good part. If you're going to slice it, this is where I slice it in half at least, which means you'll just go like that and you'll get a nice half slice for whatever you want it, salads or anything. If you want to dice it, you will chop on the top of it and go all the way through to the cutting board, but not all the way through to the end of the onion. So when you have it like that, it'll open up like that. When you chop it, every piece will then come off individually like that. And that's how you dice an onion. <clears throat> One other thing that helps, at least for us in this kitchen, is we have a hood system, so it pulls a lot of the um, mist, I guess you'd say, that comes off that makes your eyes water, makes you cry when you're um, chopping onions. So if you do have a hood, you know, above, or a vent above your stove, and you're chopping onions at least kind of close to that, turn it on, give it a chance, you know, give it a shot. Maybe it'll, it'll help you from crying in your kitchen. We now have everything for the Guinness stew in one container that we're going to cook it in. Um, just so you know, you don't need to be taking notes right now. Deb will send you an email with all, with the recipe, all the ingredients, anything, the times, the oven temperature, all that fun stuff. So sit back, relax, and just enjoy the show. Um, everything is in a pan now. The liquid you see in here is Guinness, which is the Irish stout, what we use for a lot of things here, but it is the namesake of this dish. Um, <clears throat> carrots, onions, bay leaves, thyme, oregano, and then the meat. The meat is cut into about one inch cubes. Um, again, it's as big or as little as you want. You don't want them to be too, too small. You don't want them to be too big, but it's kind of whatever you're comfortable with. If you don't want to cut them up at the end when it's on your plate, then cut them a little smaller. If you don't mind it, cut them a little bit bigger. We will wrap it in foil. The oven is at 400 degrees. Again, you don't need to write that down. Um, and you'll cook it for about an hour and a half. Then you just put it in there, let it ride. Don't worry about it. But don't forget to set your timer, most importantly. While your Guinness stew is in the oven, um, you'll want to put your potatoes on the stove to get those boiling to make mashed potatoes. However you make your mashed potatoes is perfect for this recipe. It doesn't matter. Whatever your favorite way of doing it is the, the right base for that. Um, also, as your timer gets going down, you're going to start making whatever gravy it is you like. We use a, a beef gravy since we're using beef. If you want to mix up this recipe and add any sort of vegetables to it, a different kind of meat, um, anything really. I mean, it's, it's, it's a stew at the end of the day. So however you want to play with it, what makes it Irish for us, of course, is the Guinness. Um, and, but I would recommend if, if you're doing a beef, then you would use beef gravy, chicken, you would use a chicken stock or a chicken base for your gravy, things like that. Um, so it's really, it's versatile. You can play with it, have fun with it, do whatever you want. Um, <clears throat> So as it's about to come out of the oven, you sh your mashed potatoes should be done. Your gravy should almost be done, but you're going to add some of the Guinness juice out of the beef that's been in the oven to um, just to flavor it a little bit more. So the best way we found to serve it is to <clears throat> put your potatoes in a bowl and make a little, <clears throat> a little well in the middle like that so that it's not, so you get enough potatoes, but it's not heaping over the side. Then you take your Guinness stew, we've got ours heated up in a pan here, 
and you just dump it right on top. And there you have it. Finnegan's Wake Guinness Stew. One of the best ways to eat Guinness Stew is with a piece of crusty bread. Um, so once you've eaten all your potatoes and all the meat and all the veggies, you can clean out your bowl um, with that bread and get all that gravy out of there. Also a salad with a, with a vinaigrette or something a little more acidic is good just because this has so many rich flavors that, that don't have much acid in the cream and things like that. So that's what we think. A little bit of bread, a little salad, and this beautiful Guinness stew. You can't go wrong. Happy St. Patrick's Day. You know what? It is so wonderful. We made that when we first showed that segment, and it is a wonderful, savory stew. So anyway, thank you, Finnegan's Wake. And by the way, they are open again on Trade Street in downtown Winston. So if you're getting a hankering for something Irish, um, please come. Uh, they have Guinness, and which is, is always my favorite. If I'm going to have a beer, I'm going to have a Guinness. And it's a nice, dark, stout Irish beer. So it's wonderful. So another piece of spring, for me anyway, is gardening. Now, it may be a tiny bit too early to start putting out the delicate annuals, but I took a trip to Mitchell's Nursery and Garden uh, a week or so ago and got a VIP tour of the garden from Jim Mitchell, and he is going to share with us some tips and some advice on what we could be doing in our garden right now and maybe a few things that we need to stand off just a little bit more um, he gives tax day as kind of a safe day to get some of these delicates in the ground but i'm going to let you hear from him so mr mitchell it's yours all right we want to thank you deb for coming out to mitchell's nursery and greenhouse and bringing the Aging Well program directly to us. Uh, this is my wife, Judy. My name is Jim, and we are the owners of Mitchell's Nursery and Greenhouse here in King. Uh, just thought we'd start out with something that I enjoy in really relaxing time, uh, is putting together mixed containers. Uh, I'm gonna move on. <laughs> Good to see you. A lot of times I'll take one centerpiece when they always talk about making containers they say something trailing something upright and something that catches your eye so a lot of times i'll take one piece to put in kind of the center and i like something with some height sometimes a little bit of a color but at least something evergreen it's one of those things if you got you a nice container and you got it in your front porch or somewhere uh, you put a permanent shrub of some type in the center and if you forget in the summertime next summer to put something in it or you just run out of time at least you've got something a little with a little color and green in it year-round and kind of like anything alive you know your plants are gonna need a little bit of TLC even through the winter so if you put something like this in right now or in the fall, don't forget it through the winter. I know it'll be cold and you think stuff is hibernating or gone for the winter. Well, it's not so. They'll still need some moisture. Won't need quite as much food because they're not growing as much that time of year. Have to give our plants, kind of like our children we brought up, a little bit of TLC here and that extra little push can really help the flowers. Just be sure when you plant any live plant, whether it's a flowering plant, a tree, or shrub, they need, kind of like us, they need food, water, and for the most part, a little bit of sunlight. Some plants, especially in the tree and shrub end, as well as the annual flowering plants, prefer a little more sun than others. So 
just be specific as to what you plant and the situation that it's going into, how much sunlight, direct sun. So just a few minutes is all it takes to put your container together with some color, some texture, some beautiful plants. Be sure and fertilize it. Uh, generally, I will use a slow release fertilizer, something like Osmocote that you can buy across the counter. Sprinkle a little of that across it about twice a year is all it will need. Water it in good when you plant. And then even through the winter time, like I said, if you've got these pansies or violas in there and want them to bloom through the winter, you're going to have to keep them watered. About once a week or twice a week at the most, drown them pretty good and they should bloom all winter long. Okay, besides the pansies that we grow for color, especially in the fall and early spring, late winter time, we do a lot with trees and shrubs. Uh, probably about 90% of the trees and shrubs that we sell here, we grow. Uh, we have You'd be surprised how much difference that can make in the health of that tree or shrub when you buy that plant and it's grown here through at least one full year, the summer heat, the winter cold. Then when you take it and put it in your yard, it's not something that's come out of Florida and never seen that even a 30 degree night. And then when we have that winter with teens and 20s, so much of the time it can really take a toll on that type plant. So buy locally. Uh, some of my favorites now are the weeping red buds. I've always enjoyed the weeping trees. I grow the weeping bald cypress, the weeping cherries, white and pink, and then the weeping red bud. There are a couple different varieties of the weeping red bud and one has the dark burgundy red leaf after it blooms through the summer and the other one has a beautiful golden yellow leaf. The trees and shrubs now that go in your yard depends a lot on the climate that it's going into so far as sunlight and temperature as well as how big you want that shrub to get. Uh, some of my favorites in the last several years they've developed uh, new varieties of shrubs that have pretty color. That can vary a lot with the amount of sunlight that they get. Uh, here's one example. This is called the Gold Mop. It's beautiful golden yellow color where it's been sitting here in the full sun. But when you lift that up, it's healthy, but it's just green. And that's because of the shade that that foliage is in. This will grow wonderful on the north side of your house with no direct sunlight. But in just a year or two, this beautiful golden yellow will be gone and it'll have that green color. Now you'll have a healthy plant, but you'll lose the pretty color. Uh, we've gone from the outside tree and shrub growing into the greenhouse. Uh, greenhouses we started in 1995, 96 was our first greenhouse crop. But it's getting to the springtime now. It's still early to put stuff out, but we start growing our crops for spring usually about the second week of January. After the poinsettias are gone, we sanitize the house down and start potting usually the second week. Uh, here's some geraniums. That's our big crop uh, for the spring. I love this vibrant color. It's a brighter red called the salmon, the scarlet. And uh, it has a brighter red. It'll tend to have a few more blooms than the one we grow that's the deeper, more of a fire engine red. So this has always been my favorite red. This is your salmon geranium. It has kind of a bicolor in the bloom. It has the white edging with the center of a kind of a dark salmony color. So a lot of people like the salmons. This is a salmon and then there's one called dark salmon. This past week when we potted was our first crop of four inch poinsett of four inch geraniums. Uh, we buy their little rooted cuttings in and put them in the containers. This is a four inch container. And you can dump it right now and you can see that there's no root at all coming out, but the little rooted cutting has roots on it and we stick it in here and grow it. In about five weeks, this will be a beautiful small geranium that will go out of here. Each of the pots has a little drip tube that goes into each pot and hanging basket. And you can hear some clicking right now. The fertilizer is leaving the injector and going through the drip tubes. 
that go to each of our baskets and pots on the benches. Well, like I said, we're here in February fixing to go until the 1st of March. The annual frost date for our area is April 15th. And that means that on one year, April 1st will be the last frost. But then the next year, May 1st, might be that last frost. So we have to kind of be careful with what we do in our gardens and flower beds in the spring. You can be getting those beds ready at this time. Uh, if you've got a garden area especially and no crops in it, I go through and clean out the old stems from your tomato plants and pepper plants and that type thing. Uh, get you a bag or two of something like cow manure or some type of soil conditioner and work that into the existing beds and get ready for the spring. But I would wait until we get into the about the middle of April. Usually I tell people it's an easy time to remember because it's tax day and that kind of relates to our planting of uh, gardens in this area. All right, like I said, in this same greenhouse now where we grow our geraniums, we do several rows of hanging baskets. 60, 61 baskets on each line, seven bays, four lines on a bay, 28 lines of 60. Woo, that's a lot of hanging baskets, and that's just this house on the first crop. I enjoy mixing, making uh, combos of my own. I've done this for years. There's uh, three different petunias, kind of a red, white, and blue. So that'll be a pretty combo to have in your yard, hanging on the porch, or wherever you have the room in the time, easy place to get it watered. Sometimes we'll have requests for ivy geraniums. You can see the leaf that resembles the standard geranium foliage, but it's got a little bit different texture and it will trail and cover the side of your basket. It's a beautiful one for a ground cover. If you don't want a basket, you can buy the individual pots and put it in your bed and it will spread and cover a 15, 18 inch area from that one little plant. So there's a lot of options with the colors that you see, whether you just have a limited space for the hanging basket, raised beds, uh, big containers you want some color in, or that flower bed out in the yard. And uh, we will have just thousands of different flowering plants, vegetable plants, all sorts of tomatoes, peppers, onions, cabbage, broccoli this time of year. and. Uh, we still enjoy doing it. My wife and I both graduated NC State. We've been in business officially for 45 years here in King. Now we're going into the spring and if you get that chance to come by, we do a lot of vegetable plants, all sorts of flowering plants, trees and shrubs. 90% of what's sold here is grown here. 100% pretty much of our greenhouse crops we grow. Uh, if you see some pretty color around the city of Mount Airy, then you'll know where it's come from. We grow a contract grow with the city of Mount Erie for the color you see through the town. So we enjoy doing it. Would appreciate you coming by and talking with us and also to buy a little something. Thank you. You know, I'm not going to lie to you, that was absolutely my idea of a perfect afternoon, getting to spend it with Mr. Mitchell. He gave me such a glorious tour, and there was so much more that we didn't have time to share with you. So if you're in that area, they're just king. North Carolina is just a few minutes north of Winston-Salem. So if you get a chance, go up there, speak to Mr. Mitchell, tell him you saw him on Aging Well, because he really did. He was so gracious and so kind. And, you know, people who know me, again, I always say I'll never have fingernails because the joy for me of gardening, I know I should be wearing gloves, but the joy for me is feeling that soil. And, and when it's time to weed, to really feel around in there of what I'm getting and be careful not to pull too much out. But um, again, I, I'm an animal lover. I love the animals that walk on the ground, that swim in the ocean. My husband and I love to scuba dive. And I'm also a lover of beautiful creatures that fly. And one thing that I just, I'm, I'm pushing this, not this particular book, but please go to your local bookstore and look for resources of things that you can plant that will attract 
butterflies and specifically monarchs because they're losing so much of their habitat where they can lay their eggs and go through that whole process to become the monarch butterflies that we love so dearly. You know, it's just a joy to be outside. And, you know, it's good for our mental health to be out there digging away. And, and it was so funny when I was up there with Mr. Mitchell, I said, um, well, what of this can I buy now? He goes, Deb, I know you want to do this, but you've got to wait. You've got to wait. So he pacified me with a beautiful, beautiful shrub that that currently has just these crimson leaves on it. He goes, this is something you can go home and plant now. So Mr. Mitchell, I know you're watching. So thank you so very much. You know, we think of spring being this time, I think I said in the notes of rejuvenation. And part of that is spring cleaning. And I'm just going to put myself out there as, as someone who really needed it more than a lot of people. Um, I had heard about Jill and um, Jill Moore. She owns Organized by Jill. I had heard about her from several friends who said she's just phenomenal. And so I reached out because I thought this would be an interesting segment for Aging Well. And then I had her come over to our house and take a look at our pantry and, and part of our, our, our laundry room as well, because they're, they're kind of connected. And she just, she walked in there and she goes, Deb, this is not a pantry. This has become a catch-all. And I could not agree more. But sometimes when you feel overwhelmed, you don't know where to start. So I did, I jumped and it was part of a gift I gave my husband, because as y'all know, he's the chef in our family. She said, Deb, he deserves a chef's pantry. So with a little magic from Jill and her assistant, they, they transformed this train wreck of a room from a catch-all to a beautiful chef's pantry. So I just thought it would be wonderful for her to come and join us and share some things that we can do right now to make our homes more organized, our lives more organized. And I promise you, it does make a huge mental difference. So without further ado, Jill, please tell us how we can organize our lives. Thank you, Deb. I appreciate that. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. So Deb, thank you so much. I really appreciate you inviting me out today to talk to your, to your group here. Um, spring is a really, really exciting time to talk about organizing because, of course, we're thinking about sp spring cleaning. So, you know, with the time change and the weather's getting better, we're ready to throw up on our windows and start going through our stuff and renewing and refreshing our spaces. So that is what I'm going to talk to you about tonight. Um, like Deb said, my name is Jill. I'm a certified professional home organizer based here in Winston-Salem. I am a um, member of the American Society of Professional Home Organizers, as well as a member of the Carolina Organizers. Um, I have been organizing professionally since November of 2020, and together with my team, we take spaces that are a little, a little overwhelmed by clutter, and we turn them into a calm and peaceful and functional space. Um, again, you know, it's spring, so time to talk about home organization, and that's always a hot topic, um, especially with now in the media. You see a lot of TV shows talking about home organization and just a lot of articles written about home organization, and it's just become a really, really big topic. And even um, when you go out into the stores, you see all kinds of organizing products, and um, it's just one of the things that I can talk about all day long. So these are some of the things that we're going to talk about tonight, why we have clutter, benefits of home organization, how to declutter and organize, and then we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A. So. so clutter is one of those things that's really, really sneaky. It's not something that happens overnight. Typically, it usually takes time over years. You know, while we're busy living our lives and enjoying our time and enjoying our families and, you know, working hard and doing all the things, slowly but surely, the clutter can creep into our space. And before you know it, we look up and we're surrounded. And, um, one of the things that really uh, I talk to my clients a lot about is, you know, what starts as an innocent ketchup drawer then becomes a junk drawer and a silverware drawer, you know, with all the takeout, all the takeout silverware and whatnot. And it just slowly snowballs and gets gets a little out of control. And before you know it, our kitchen is full of clutter and our closets are full of clutter and our garage is full of clutter. And it's time to, to really tackle that. And like right now, we live in a society where it's so, so easy to get things just at, at the click of a button. 
you know, we have instant gratification. We can go online, we can buy things, and we may not have planned on where we're going to put the thing, how we're going to use the thing, you know, where how we're going to maintain it. So it's really, really easy for clutter to creep in over time. And it's really, really sneaky. So you really have to be on alert and um, not allow clutter to come into your space. All right. Uh, five reasons you have clutter. Delayed decisions. One of the things that we home organizers always like to say is later is the best friend of clutter. Because a lot of these decisions we say, oh, we'll deal with it later. We'll deal with it later. We'll deal with it later. And, you know, later has to happen eventually. We always say later is the best friend of clutter. So when I'm working with clients, I always say, okay, it's time to deal with that later box. Today's the day. Today is later. There is no more later. Today is the day. We're going to deal with it right now. So that is one of the things that um, I encourage you to do is really take a look at those piles that you've designated for later, pull it out, and go ahead and take the time to go through it. Um, one of the other big culprits of clutter is um, bulk buying. Many of us belong to Sam's Club or Costco, and it's so easy to bring those things into our home. But unless we have somewhere to store it, and if we can use it before it expires, those are the two things to look out for when you're buying in bulk. So those are some of the um, hard hitters of why we have clutter. And of course, number five, the reason down there is sentimental clutter. Sentimental clutter is a huge, huge thing for many, many people. A lot of times people have been passed along things from family members or from well-meaning neighbors or, you know, just people next door. And, you know, um, when that clutter comes in, sometimes it's like they felt guilty about getting rid of it. So instead of getting rid of it themselves, they pass that burden on to you, which is really not a fair burden. So you really have to think when people are trying to give you things and say, you know, thank you. I appreciate you thinking of me, but let's go ahead and bless someone else with this stuff and just let it go before it even comes in your door. Okay. Some of the benefits of home organization. And the first two really go hand in hand. Um, more free time because we're not spending all that time and energy looking for things. And um, when everything has a space in your home, you know exactly where to go to get that item, whether it's a book or a piece of clothing or something in the pantry or something in your kitchen. When you know where it is, you're going to save so much time. Um, saving money. No more buying duplicate items to replace the things that you think you've lost but are really just in the back of the pantry. And of course, it's great for your mental health. Decluttering and organization is so, so good for the mental health. I always uh, see a lot of people who deal with a lot of like anxiety about the clutter. And when we really start to dig in and start decluttering and going through things, you can see the shoulders go from here and it just sort of is relaxing. And people always say, that was like therapy. That was so good. I really enjoyed it. You know, it, it's really great for the mental health. So something to consider. One of the ones that I really want to focus on here is um, item number four, where it enhances creativity and focus. I have a lot of clients who deal with ADD and ADHD, and a lot of times it's because they're just, well, not because of, of the clutter, but that is something that, you know, gets in the way of them being productive in their homes because of the clutter. They, they've just got so many things going on, and it's just overstimulation in their home. And from the time we wake up until the time we go to bed, you are making hundreds of decisions a day. And when you've got to come home back from, you know, from your daily activity and you come back home and then you're just surrounded by clutter, it can really impede your ability to be productive and creative in your space. So that's something also to consider. Um, decision fatigue. That is a big one. We Sometimes we get really tired of making these decisions. Like I said, we're making hundreds of decisions a day. And, um, you know, it can be really overwhelming. So when a little bit further and on the presentation, I'm going to talk about how to reduce the decision fatigue by going slow through your decluttering process. This is one of my favorite quotes about home organization. The more stuff I donated, the more I was able to breathe. The more trash I threw away, the more the weight I felt lifted. The more stuff I took out of our home, the more I was able to see a new life. The more uncluttered I lived, the more joy I found. This is one of my favorite quotes from from any organizers. And um, it really it really is accurate. You know, like you're able to breathe. When your space is breathing, you are breathing. And that's something to keep in mind. Um, how to declutter. So one of the things that you want to think about when you're, if you've never decluttered in your life before, is to just start small. Say, today I'm going to tackle just the top drawer of my vanity. Or today I'm going to tackle the junk drawer. 
don't go into your kitchen and say, okay, I'm going to pull everything out of the cabinets, put it all over my counter, become immediately overwhelmed and not know where to go from there. You're going to start small, build a little bit of momentum, start small with a small project and go from there. When you see those small victories, it can really inspire you to continue your decluttering journey. Um, set a timer. Don't go at it for a whole day. That is a surefire way to get that decision fatigue that we just talked about. You're going to want to set a timer, say 10 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, whatever your schedule allows to really, um, you know, tackle the clutter. Set realistic goals. Again, that's talking about not deciding to pull everything out of the kitchen cabinets or everything out of the closet. If you're not used to doing that level of decluttering in one, one set time period, it can be really overwhelming. Um, include household members. This is an important one because, because clutter and the things in your home is really everyone's responsibility. Whether you've got you know little ones in the house or your spouse in the house or whomever is living in your space under your roof really is responsible for taking care of the clutter. It's everybody's job to take care of the communal spaces, especially the living room, the kitchen. Um, you know, it's a little bit different in the bedrooms because that is their private space. But in a communal space, it, it really is a team effort to keep your space organized. And then of course, declutter first because you cannot organize clutter. You must declutter first. Every single project has to be decluttered before you can organize. Don't skip that important step. Um, these are these are some of the habits for a clutter-free life. Don't put it down, put it away. You know that pile sitting on the kitchen counter? That is the culprit of just putting it down instead of walking the five steps to just put it away. So always take the, take the extra step, put it away, and you will help reduce the clutter, like the daily clutter that comes in. Make a shopping list and stick to it. Stay away from those impulse buys because oftentimes the impulse buys have to find a space that we weren't anticipating finding for that stuff. So you really want to stick to a list. Create drop, drop zones for donations. This is the number one tip I give all my clients after we declutter is keep an ongoing donation pile. Make sure that you've got a box or a bin or a bag, something that when it gets full, it's time to let it go. One of the big initiatives that you may have seen on the internet is when people are getting these Amazon boxes, hang onto the box, fill it with donations, put it back in your car and let it go out the door to donate. Um, follow the one in one out rule. So this is a really good one because um, you know, getting organized and staying organized are two different things. Getting organized is when you go through your big declutter, you get rid of everything, and you decide what's right for your space. How many shirts can fit in your space? How many pots and pans can fit in your space? And then when you when you bring new stuff in, you've got to switch it out. If you've got five new sweaters for Christmas, five old sweaters have to go. That's the difference between getting organized and staying organized. It's always keeping up with that one in, one out. And then the last the last tip is end your day with a 10 minute tidy. And what that means is go around, you know, fold any blankets that you've used, put any remote controls away, wipe down the kitchen counters, make sure the dishwasher is loaded. So that way, when you get up in the morning, you're greeted by a clean kitchen ready to start your day. And that's just a nice, a nice kind of reset for your day every day. Um, how to think like a minimalist. Now, minimalism is one of the extremes of organizing. That is a very, um, very strict way to to live your life where people have gone down to capsule wardrobes and they've gone down to just like the bare minimum. And um, that may not be for everybody, but um, these are these are some of the tips that you can think about if you're considering minimalism. Um, but I did wanna share, share some resources with you. These are some of the things that you can look into at the library or online and get a copy of. Um, that way you can kind of kickstart your organizing, organizing journey. Um, one of the books you may have heard of is The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up by Marie Kondo. I will tell you that this book changed my life. This kickstarted my, my decluttering journey in my own home um, about 15 years ago now. But I mean, it really is great advice. This is probably the number one book that I see in people's houses. You know, read it, take it to heart, read it again, digest it, take some of the advice that Marie, Marie has. She really is one of the experts. A second resource that you've got is The Growls from the Home Edit. You may have seen online, they live in their they live their life in rainbow order. Everything from the pantries to the kitchens um, to the closets, everything is in rainbow order. Now, this is one of this is almost the opposite of the uh, minimalist extreme. This is going the other way. So that's another resource for you. And the last resource that I want to share for you, just if you want to get a little inspiration, this book is called Organized Living 
And this will give you a look into some of the top professional home organizers around the world, right into their homes. They talk about their systems and things that they have in place in their own spaces that have helped them become organized. So that, that is really a good read and definitely motivational for you. Uh, now we're ready for questions. So I'm gonna stop sharing so Deb can come back on. Okay. This is wonderful. And again, thank you, Jill. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, what we're going to do, I know I've had one question come in. Y'all bring them through the chat. That's the best way to always get these conversations going. Mm -hmm. um, a, a very good friend of mine has was anticipating your session, and she has a question about how do you organize photographs? Sure. Because she has inherited... Um, a lot of photographs from her recently deceased parents, mm -hmm. and she doesn't know what to do with them. And some That's of the people she knows, some of the people she doesn't even know who they are. That is a very good question, Deb. Like you said, the pictures of people that she doesn't know who they are, she doesn't have to feel that burden of keeping those things. She is able to let those go. Maybe those people were meaningful to her parents in their life, but if she doesn't know who they are, it's not her burden to maintain pictures of these people forever. And one of the things that you can do with these pictures, if you don't have the time or energy or capacity to scan all these pictures and get them digital, the ones you do want to keep, there are um, professional home organizers that specialize in photo organization. Like I'm a hands-on organizer. I go into people's pantries and kitchens and playrooms and offices, but there are people who actually specialize in organizing photographs. And one of the companies that you can make a note of is called Picture Me Organized. And if you go to their website, I believe it's pictureMeOrganized.com, but you can Google that. Um, they have all kinds of photo organizing services where they can digitize your photos and give you back, you know, just a, digital copies of your of your photos. So, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so what if I'm downsizing? Mm -hmm. How do I do that appropriately mm -hmm. that I'm not maybe getting rid of things my children? Mm -hmm. or grandchildren may want, mm -hmm. what's a way to include an expanded family in some That's of these right. decisions? Have an honest conversation with your children and grandchildren. You know, my parents' generation and their parents' generation came from a different time where they wanted to pass everything along. They had that scarcity mindset. And you know, I mean, people today are not, they don't have the space for it. They have their houses full of their own things. They may not want these things. So even though you may have saved it, for all these years hoping that they would want it if your kids and grandchildren are saying i don't have room for it i don't really want it maybe can i just take a picture of the item and have that memory of it without taking the physical item into my home you know have those honest hard conversations and pass it along to somebody who, who may benefit from from the items that you're trying to get rid of instead of foisting it onto your children and and again I, that me my biggest problem is hanging on to things that are sentimental. Mm -hmm. And you gave me some really good advice. Yeah. And I wish you would share that with everybody because it really did lighten my load. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What What's meaningful to you may not be meaningful to your children. And what was meaningful to your parents may not be meaningful to you. And it really is about keeping the things that are really important to you and your family. And also when you, when you do have a sentimental item, instead of shoving it in a cardboard box in the back of the closet to be forgotten about, pull it out. Find a place to, to honor it in your home. And not everything has to be kept. You know, just the special things. Maybe it's religious memorabilia or a couple photo, you know, photo albums. Find a place to showcase those in your home where you can actually enjoy them. Because if they're in your garage or they're in, you know, the back of your closet, you're not enjoying these things. And you're, just, you're certainly not honoring the memory. Well, and I liked what you said about have them, but have them in a special place. But mm -hmm. they don't have to be in a place that kind of hampers your day-to-day -day activities. That's and to true, me, yeah. that, that, mm. really, that really hit home. Okay, okay. I've got another question okay. um, or an idea. Okay. okay, so here is just an idea. Get a digital frame, take pictures mm -hmm. of pictures and put them on the digital frame. You will enjoy mm -hmm. the rotation yes. of the pictures every day instead of mm -hmm. having photo albums that you yes. ra rarely look at. Yes, that is an excellent suggestion. You know, just the digital frames that, that you know, recycle the pictures and, you know, flip through them and you can set the timer so you can enjoy a picture every how, however often you want to set it to rotate. That's a very good tip. So if, if I want to get started, mm -hmm. say maybe in my kitchen, mm -hmm. 
what would you say would be the best way for me to, what would be the best place to start? The best place to start, the junk drawer. Always start in your junk drawer because that's the place where things have crept in. You know, you've got those paper clips and the soy sauce packets and the dead batteries and all those things and really scoop it out, go through it, see what you really want to keep, what's just actually junk and let it go. Take some time to clean out the drawer while you've got it empty, you know, spray the spray the cleaner and then invest in just a couple drawer organizers. You know, you can get them at the dollar store, you can get them on Amazon and really kind of contain what you're actually going to keep so you can find the things. Because oftentimes I go into people's houses and you can't find anything in those junk drawers. So having a little bit of containment in there, you know, investing in a set of drawer organizers for, you know, a couple of dollars is is something that will really help you make the most of that space where you can put all your pencils together and all your gift cards together and all the things that you actually want to keep in your junk drawer together. And then, you know, slowly go through and um, and really evaluate what you want to store in your home. You know, you don't need all the ketchup packets. You don't need all the Chick-fil-A packets. They're really nice <laughs> at Chick-fil-A. If you ask them nicely, they will give you more Chick-fil-A sauce. No, but what if I need that other soy sauce packet? I'm, I unlikely. need it. <laughs> it's unlikely. I think we all have a bottle of soy sauce in the fridge. I know. So. I know. <laughs> no, and it is. It's it's these are valid mm -hmm. ideas and and I am the first to admit my children would would all raise their hand and say she's horrible because I mean I even have pictures that my, our 42-year-old daughter drew when she was in daycare. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's just those things I'm not letting go of, mm -hmm. but again, I've moved them Mm -hmm. And now they're in a very special place where yeah. I can, I can enjoy and, and yeah. remember those days when, mm -hmm. when the kids made such special things. You know, that brings up a really good point, Deb, because a lot of times, you know, we've kept every scribble from everything that has come in, you know, every little marker, you know, scribble that has come in over the years and we can't keep all that. So I, I do recommend taking time with your children to go through it, you know, keep the handprints, keep the footprints, keep the turkey hands, things like that, yeah. and let the scribbles go. And then it's a more manageable amount of stuff for you to enjoy. Okay, so we've got another question. How do you change a hoarding friend's thought of their motto, as soon as I throw it away, I need it? So that hoarding is a little bit different. Hoarding is a little bit different. You do need um, a specialized person who is you know, who specializes in hoarding, oftentimes a mental health professional to come in and help you know, go through that kind of stuff because it's a little bit different level than your average person who's like, I have a lot of stuff, you know, but I can still, I still can see my countertops. I can still sit on the couch. I can still sleep on the bed, but hoarding is a little bit different of a specialty. So, um, if you're not a licensed mental health therapist, you're probably not the right resource for them. You really do need to, um, bring somebody in who is a specialist in that. And you can look on, um, either the ASPO website, which is amspo.com and it'll, I'm sorry, dot dot org and you can look up the listings of home organizers or also napo n-a-p-o dot net and that will also give you a directory of home organizers and it will give lists of specialties too so it's important that you find the right resource for that person right mm -hmm. and you know what i've learned from the friends who recommended you to me is yeah. that um maybe i'm downsizing or mm -hmm. maybe i'm having a second home or mm -hmm. you know whatever the reason it just now is the best time to jump in and just do it, mm -hmm. yes. you know, because I, I think what how you mentioned, it's very easy to put things like this off. Yes. But now now's a good time. It's mm -hmm. fun. You don't want to leave these decisions for your kids to deal with. Right. You want to deal with it now, process these things, pass it along to somebody who you think may enjoy it or just let it go to goodwill and let the burden leave your home now so you have the freedom to enjoy what you want to do maybe in your retirement or you know spend time with your family instead of having to deal with clutter it's like let right. that stuff go out keep just the stuff that we're actually using and enjoying let everything else go and be able to enjoy your space a little bit better and you hit on something to me that maybe is the most important message of everything yeah. is that thinking about your kids mm -hmm. That if something were to happen, yeah. they are now going to be stuck with all of this and it's going to even mean less to them mm -hmm. than it might have meant to me. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, to me, yeah. that's my motivation. Mm -hmm. uh, my sweet husband, who I just adore, 
uh, made a comment that maybe uh, UNC School of the Arts would like some of my old clothes because they're that out of date. Uh, <laughs> and I, I can't say that that he's wrong. I mean, yeah. I, I am bad about holding on to clothes mm -hmm. because yeah. typically I buy really nice things. Mm -hmm. And well, it's going to come back in style. It's <laughs> going to come back in style. And so yeah. I just keep thinking about your words and our kids mm -hmm. And, and yeah. I, I've already promised him that was my New Year's resolution Yes, is to go yeah. through and, and declutter. Declutter. You know, with the fact that the, uh, the statistic they say about clothes is we wear 20% of our clothes 80% of the time. That means the si same five outfits are seeing the light of day while everything else is being pushed to the back. And it's okay to let those go. Yep. And there's mm -hmm. so many organizations that really mm -hmm. need clothes. Mm -hmm. you know, when people retire, I'm not going to mm -hmm. need my my suits, my, you know, my dressy work clothes mm -hmm. anymore. So maybe that would be the best time if you're on the verge of retiring to let some of those suits go to these organizations that mm -hmm. are helping men and women yes. enter, re-enter the workforce. So yes. there's lots of good things. And mm -hmm. I think that makes me anyway feel better mm -hmm. about letting things go that I'm not throwing it away mm -hmm. I'm letting it move on to somebody that really it mm -hmm. it makes a difference and yeah. it can help them instead of thinking what if I need it someday shift your mindset to who can benefit from it now yep I love it I love it well Jill I appreciate so much you spending some time with us I know I certainly have learned a lot mm -hmm. um and so anyway I thank you so much and um, I just want to invite everyone to, to please be here next month, April 9th, for our next one. We have some amazing sessions coming up. So until then, live well and age well and get out there and play and enjoy some of this gorgeous weather. <laughs>